शन्नो मित्र शंवरुण शन्नो भवत्मा शन्न इंद्रो बृहस्पति शन्नो विष्णुक्रम नमो ब्रह्मणे नमस्ते वायो वायमे प्रत्यक्ष ब्रह्मासी प्रत्यक्ष ब्रह्म वदिष्या ऋत वदिष्या सत्यम वदिष्या तन्मावत तद्भक्तावत अवत मवत भक्ता शाति 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 हरि ओ भद्रंकर्णे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्येमाक्षजत्र स्थिरंग सुष्टुवाग सस्तनो विशेम देवितयदायु स्वस्ति न इंद्रो वृद्ध श्रवा स्वस्ति न पूषा विश्व स्वस्ति न साक्ष्यो अरिष्टने स्वस्ति नो बृहस्पतिर्दा ओ शाति 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 हरि ओ यंदो विश्व छंदोभ्योद्यमृता संबूव सेंद्रो मेधया स्पृणत अमृत देवधारणो भूयास शरीर मे विचर्षण जिह्वा मे मधुमत्तमा कर्णाभ्यां भूरी विश्रुव ब्रह्मण कोशोसी मेधया पिता श्रुत मे गोपाय ओ शाति 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 हरि ओ तछ्योरवृणीमहे गा गापत दैवी स्वस्तिरस्तु नवस्तिर्माषेभ्य ऊर्ध्व जिगा भेषज शो अस्तुदीपे शुष्पे ओ शाति 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 हरि ओ पूर्णमद पूर्णमीद पूर्णा पूर्णमुदच्यते पूर्ण से पूर्णमादा पूर्णमेवशिष्य शाति 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 हरि ओ Namaskaram, Ellarkum, Namaskaram. We are very, very happy to have a very eminent author, a eminent, should I say, Swadeshi Indologist, uh, eminent technocrat. Of course, he was a former technocrat amongst us. He has been kind of fighting a lone battle. for our sake for our heritage for us to understand and appreciate what we have really inherited and uh, on this note may i request parma pooja swami sukadevananda ji who is the secretary of the ram vivekananda college chennai to come out to the stage and i would like to request sri rajiv malhotra ji to come out to the stage Rajiv ji is a student of science a entrepreneur has risen up the corporate ladder to the level of a senior vice president in ITNT he had invested in several companies and at the age of 45 or so had a inner calling and the guidance of his guru dedicated his life for what he has been working now for the past 25 years he considers it his tapasya to be able to write new or uh, do research very detailed research on what is affecting what is afflicting our sanatana dharma 
and we are very glad to share that he has written a new book called The Battle of Sanskrit, which was released, formally released this morning by Sri Gopal Swami, who is the former Chief Election Commissioner of India and the Chancellor of Rashtri Sanskrit Sansan Tirupati. We had it just this morning in Bharti Vyabhavan. I uh, would like to now request Param Pujya Swami Sukadevananda Ji to hand over a memento to Raji Malhotra Ji, welcoming him for this. Rajiv Ji has been an investor in the corporate world. Then he started investing in people who could develop the capabilities to answer the questions raised by Western Indologists. He had given several grants and donations to several institutions and professors. And the outcome of such an effort was the Invading the Sacred. He was the protagonist of that book. After that, he took over and along with Arvind Nilakantan wrote this book called Breaking India. It's a path-breaking book to understand the dynamics of what's happening in Tamil Nadu, right? Especially on the Dharma front. After that, he wrote a new book called Being Different, which essentially looks at our civilization, which we should look at with our own lens rather than the Western lens. After that, he wrote a very interesting book called Indrasnet, which kind of brings out how the Western Western Indologists and scholars have been looking at Hinduism as something cooked up by Vivekananda, and it's just over 200 years old, right? The new Hinduism. And now he is going to talk to us about the fact that in this book, Battle for Sanskrit, what is it that is there as the Samskritic harmony between the Paramartika and Vyavaharika in Sanskrit? and how it's very important for all of us to understand the nuances of it. May I now request Sri Rajiv Malhotra Ji to come and address us, Rajiv Ji. Namaskar. I'm indeed honored uh, to be here. I'm always very honored to be invited in any place with Swami Vivekanand Association because he was the true hero of uh, modern dharma all over the world. So all of us in our own humble ways are trying to continue what uh, Swamiji started and continues to inspire us. <clears throat> for This is my fifth book. It's called The Battle for Sanskrit. Actually, it's Sanskriti, The Battle for Sanskriti. Indian civilization, dharma, Vedic culture, Hinduism, all those you can think of. Because Sanskrit is the DNA, it's the architecture for all our Sanskriti. So the battle for Sanskrit is sort of the battle for all our culture, civilization. That's what I'm trying to talk about. The question comes, who is fighting whom in this battle? I'll talk about. And what is the battle about? What are they fighting about? So the byline has three questions that show two camps. Is Sanskrit political or sacred? Is Sanskrit political or sacred? Oppressive or liberating? Dead or alive? Now, there's a very powerful camp of Western Sanskrit studies with a lot of influence among Indians, media people, university professors, government people, which takes the first, first position in each of these three pairs. So according to them, Sanskrit is political, oppressive, and dead. The second option in each of these three questions says Sanskrit is sacred, liberating, alive, which is the position I defend. So that's the battle. The, it has become fashionable for Marxist, leftist, atheist, Gnostic scholarship to take on Sanskrit as a as a body of texts 
not just language, but Sanskrit as a body of text, Vedas, Itihas, grammar, you know, Smritis, and think of them as not sacred at all, which means that, of course, they claim, they know that people claim them to be sacred, but they don't consider Shruti to be genuine and valid. They don't, they reject the Shruti claim. And they claim that the Paramarthika and Vivarika aspects in the Vedas are not, cannot both be true. In fact, only Vivarika has to be studied and considered useful. Paramarthika is the sacred side, the transcendental side, is to be sidelined because it's a sign of being primitive, backward, superstitious, irrational. Since you can't measure it empirically the way you can measure and test Vivarika truths, you can't do that for Paramarthika. So Paramarthika is rejected by this group of people. Besides removing the Paramarthika from the context, because in our tradition we look at the, we put, we look sacredness as the context in which we read the text. When we read any Sanskrit text, we look at it through the lens of sacredness. But, so they removed that, and that is not the reason, that is not the method for looking at these texts according to them. They add two things, which they see as, as the crux, the tattva of these texts. One is social oppression. That we are, they have to look at, you know, shudras being oppressed, women being oppressed, somebody being excluded, Sanskrit is privileged, upper caste, this sort of thing. So they're looking at it like a human rights problem. They're looking at the data to look for human rights problems. So you can see the motive. And the second thing they want to add is political. That this, these texts have always had a political design, always. It's not something recent. Political, the Rajas sponsored these texts because they wanted to spread their power. So political domination of the ruling elite was the motive for these texts. So the debate is between insiders and outsiders. Insiders, and I count myself as one of them, I would count our monks in Ramakrishna mission, various other lineages, uh, you know, Pithams, Mathas, as insiders. Uh, as insiders are those who consider the legitimacy of the Veda, Vedic Shruti, who, can, who see divinity as the basic purpose of these texts to, uh, to un unravel and get us closer to that re the transcendent reality, who see this as adhyatmic truth, who see our tradition as something which is part of our svadharma, our sadhana. So this, the, the basic uh, insider view is one of uh, acceptance of the tenets as the Vedas want to be seen. <clears throat> now, the outsiders in olden days were called charvaks. They dismissed the Vedas. They made fun of them. They said, all oh, this is mumbo jumbo, it's hocus pocus, incorrect. It's meant to mesmerize and uh, make a fool out of people, exploit them. So the outsiders do not believe what the insiders accept. Now, in the, there's nothing wrong in having outsiders, nothing wrong. We don't stop them. We don't burn books. We don't uh, accuse people and tell them to stop. We have a long tradition of debate. So we debate them. And in the Vedic times, the Vedic people debated the Charvaks, who were atheists. The difference is today, the Charvaks have come back. The leftist Marxist atheists today are Charvaks 2.0. That's how I, in this book, I have a section called Return of the Charvaks. So Charvaks are back with a vengeance. They are more powerful than the previous Charvaks because they got money, material, power, and wealth. They're funded by powerful organizations. They work in prestigious Ivy Leagues. Indian government giving them Padam Shiris and Padam Bhushans. Narayan Murthy giving them millions of dollars to take control of translating these books. So they have penetrated the Indian 
mind more than before. This, the last 500 years, Western science, technology, and rise of the material world has been a big boon to the Charvaks. Because now Charvaks can say, uh, to make airplanes, it was not necessary to know any Shruti, to make your smartphone, to make internet, car, all the things we enjoy, it's not because of anything to do with Brahman, idea of Brahman, idea of Vedant, not used. So maybe those are true or not true, but they are ir irrelevant to the main things progressing society. So Charvaks have valid, good, powerful arguments, the Charvaks 2.0, because they are riding on the wave of the success of this kind of civilization, the modern Western world of the last 500 years. So the Indian Charvaks have got something to latch on to and say, okay, now we are back. Previous Charvaks didn't have that. And the modern Charvaks can say we are connected with Harvard, Columbia, Oxford, and I fly there, I'm part of that. So the glamour is there. So it can impress the masses. The masses feel, okay, these, this is the real stuff, and we have, that's the role model. The Charvaks have become fashionable. It's fashionable. It's cool, their lifestyle. So don't uh, trivialize or dismiss the return of the Charvaks. They're very strong and more threatening than the past. Now, I'm not insulting or accusing or abusing these people. Actually, I'm lifting them up to a high stature because being called Charvaks is a, is a sign of being a very good scholar. Charvaks in the past were good scholars. It's, there was not, it was not that they were, did not know Sanskrit or they lacked rigor or that they were not intelligent. The problem we had is their basic metaphysical assumptions we don't agree with. Their basic metaphysical assumptions were that this world of senses, material world, is the ultimate world and there's nothing beyond it. So being an atheist was their basic starting point. And to, to call the whole Indian left and Marxists and secularists as Charvak 2.0. In a sense, I'm glorifying, I'm, lift, I'm giving them stature. I'm giving them stature. I'm saying that, okay, uh, we, we know such people, we've had them before, and you are back. So we will deal with you again. The challenge it creates is for our insiders. People who are embedded in Vedic culture must no longer ignore these Charvaks, have to respond to them. So I've written this book. This is my Purva Paksh of the Charvak 2.0. Like Shankara did Purva Paksh of the opponent in those days, Purva Mamsa, those kind of people, yeah, Sankhya people, uh, Buddhists. Today, Purva Paksh of those is not so important because they are not the ones threatening us. It's Charvak 2.0. They are all over in India. A lot of Indians fashionable to be Charvaks. So, it is important for the insiders, the traditional scholars of Vedic uh, lifestyle, Vedic culture, Vedic philosophy, to accept that we have now got a challenge from Charvak 2.0 and to give a response. I'm writing this book, not scolding the Charvaks, but scolding the insiders for not doing their job and not studying the Charvaks seriously and not giving them a response. I'm saying, I went to the Sanskrit college in uh, Karnataka, Karnataka Sanskrit college in Bangalore a few days ago. And there are a couple hundred people. And so I said, how many of you have done Purva Paksha of the prominent Western Indologists today? At first, nobody raised their hand. Then one guy, and then second. Out of two, three hundred people, two claimed to have done Purva Paksha. Now that's unfortunate because our tradition says you must study the other. You can't dismiss them, you can't ignore them, you can't trivialize them, you can't bombastically say, oh, they're all bad, we don't need to worry about it. One guy said, I reject them because they're Rakshasas, so I don't need to study them. And I said, that's not accepted. It's not acceptable. You have to give an answer to his position. If a, he said, no, they have bad gunas. I said, if a, person with good guna or bad guna would hit a sixer. You can't say he's not allowed the sixer because he's got bad guna. Sixer is a sixer. According to the rules of cricket, it's a sixer. 
if a person wins chess tournament you can't look at his character and say okay he's got bad character he can't win if einstein is somebody shows that einstein had bad morality you can't say his theory of relativity is wrong so the person and what they are producing are two separate things the person may be a bad kind of person but he may have come up with some logic that we have to deal with so you so you see our people are too easy to dismiss and trivialize the opponent and i feel that is a very serious problem it is it is our laziness you could say it is our tamas that we don't want to face this either we don't want to face it for one bunch of reasons or we join them lot of our insiders are on their payroll of the outsiders this is another thing i found while looking for scholars to help me in this book i asked lot of people and top sanskrit chancellor vice chancellor deans of sanskrit departments chair of sanskrit departments referred me to good scholars and i engaged some of them some they wanted to do it as a principal some they we had to engage them with compensation to help me understand what is going on but i must say not one of them produced anything useful and they dropped out some of them dropped out in a few days or a few weeks some of them dropped out in 3 4 months one very honest person in bangalore well known says i've spent several weeks you've given me this 5 600 page book of the western indologists to read and analyze and discuss with you i've only been able to understand the first 20 pages because it's written in very heavy english it refers to western thinkers we don't know about it refers to western siddhanta that we don't know about so i'll have to go and get a library i'll have to take a lot of time maybe it'll take 2 3 years just to understand what is he talking about so one of the problems faced by the traditional scholar is we are that many of them are not trained in english and even if they know english they do not know western siddhant they don't know who's benjamin who's gramsci who's vico and on and on who's heidegger i mean there are so many western thinkers intelligent profound thinkers in their own with their own siddhanta with their own world view and we can't sort of say okay all that is wrong we have to understand it and then give an answer so purva paksh means we have to understand the other side uttar paksh we give a response lot of our people try to give uttar paksh without doing the purva paksh which means it's opinion yeah i don't understand you i don't need to understand you but i got a lot of opinions not allowed you, to debate you must understand you must understand i wrote a 500 page book to give you my understanding of what they're saying maybe it's right maybe it's wrong maybe you can argue but this is my best understanding i put it on the record and based on this i give a response so this kind of rigor we haven't had our traditional people haven't had now all this ref- leads us to the issue of adhikar who has adhikar to talk and discuss our tradition right now the adhikar has is it exists with the outsiders it's the only civilization among the major civilizations whose adhikar is with the outsiders china studies mandarin studies is done by chinese chinese universities lead the effort not harvard chinese control the journals that are most prestigious chinese control the conferences all the westerners who want to study china they go to chinese universities for a degree that's the most prestigious degree similarly japan studies is controlled by japan russian studies you need to know the russian language and that's where the academic work is done arab studies they study arabic persian studies controlled by iran but indian studies is controlled by harvard columbia chicago oxford so my goal is to bring the adhikar back and i call that swadeshi indology we have to counter the videshi indology not by dismissing them or banning them or doing all kind of wrong things or acts of abuse or violence or something but by creating our own counter argument our own swadeshi indology there is an echo i think if you don't keep changing it it will be better just make it adjust it yeah is it okay uh, is it okay 
So then don't change it at all. Just leave it, please. Thank you. So the question comes, who has adhikar? Because I'm often asked, who are you to represent the tradition? And the Westerners basically claiming that only they can give you the certificate. And I point out to them that neither Sri Ramakrishna nor Sri Swami Vivekanand had a Western degree or PhD or some certification to qualify them. Nor did Sri Aurobindo, nor did Ramana Maharshi, nor did Adi Shankara, nor did Krishna. I mean, they didn't have, we, we are, uh, the Adhikaris in our tradition are not based on some Western certification. Even within our tradition, there are multiple kinds of Adhikars. Learnedness in texts is only one kind of Adhikar, Shastra, expert. We also have people who get their Adhikar through a profound experience of Bhakti. May not even be learned, may not even be literate, but huge experience in Bhakti gives them that exalted state and gives them that Adhikar to talk about what that state is. We have yogis. To be a yogi, you don't need to have, know how to read and write. Like a sitar player, don't need to know how to read and write. Yeah? Like a chef, does not need to know how to read and write. These are embodied knowledge, knowledge embodied in you. And you tr teach, you learn from somebody else, oral tradition. One guru with embodied knowledge teaches somebody with embodied knowledge. So, yogi with adhyatmic knowledge, tantric with, with embodied knowledge, bhakti with embodied knowledge, don't even have to be text learned necessarily. Guru, guru as somebody with adhikar, transmitting to another person and that person gets the adhikar is not a system that the West understands. So our systems, multiple systems of adhikar and how it is transmitted is very interesting. The guru system is distinct. The yogi who achieves embodied state is distinct. The shastri who is text-based, the jnani who has done his transformation, nididhyasanam, as Adi Shankara said, the bhakti person, there are many kinds of uh, adhikars. So even amongst us, forget the West, even amongst us, we don't consider that there is just one type of adhikar. But the West has asserted its adhikar as a kind of monopoly over our tradition. So uh, this is, this is a, a problem, this is an issue I, 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 I take exception with. And uh, among the major problems I see in this book, the most important is the attempt to secularize by sidelining, marginalizing the sacred dimension, the transcendent, transcendental reality, the Paramarthika. Now, for us, Paramarthika and Vevarika are one integral unity. There is the Nirgun and Sagun. There is the transcendent and its manifestation. There is the divinity and its Leela. So if we were to dismiss, ignore the transcendent realm, we become Charvaks, atheists, materialists. There's no guiding principle for Dharma. There, there is just a very practical, whatever you can get away with. It's, a, it's that sort of a world we end up in. And we know there's a problem with that kind of a world. Part of our problems in the world today are linked to excessive materialism, excessive consumerism, too much ego driving things. On the other, at the other extreme, if you have only Paramarthika and the person is escaping the Vivarika, escapist, then the person doesn't, doesn't have a social ethics. He's not concerned. He doesn't have compassion, you see. So Swamiji created this Tattva Masi ethic, Swami Vivekananda. 
that the reason for compassion, Christians say love thy neighbor, but they don't say why. I love the neighbor, I love the other person because I see in him the same. Tattva Masi, the Tattva Masi ethic that Swami Vivekananda initiated, with, uh, start, uh, pioneered with this modern interpretation. It's an old Vedantin idea, but he reinterpreted, brought it into the modern place. Is a, is a very good example of living in the world. The pa passage goes through the world. The dharma is in this world. The karma is in this world. The bhakti is in this world, leading to a transcendent ultimate. So this balance is very important. If you dismiss this world and only say, OK, the paramarthika, the point is we are in this world. We have been taken birth. Our prayer brought us here. We have to work it out. We have to go through this world. We have to start where, where we are, standing right now. We can't assume that we push a button and we're out of here. So this escapism from the vivarika, the lokika, doesn't work because it leads to irresponsible action. You could do anything and say, oh, this is all mithya anyway. You could, you could commit murder and say it's all mithya. Doesn't matter. You could be a malpracticing doctor, kill some patients, and you could say dead or alive, doesn't matter, it's all mithya. So that isn't allowed. You, you are account, whether it's mithya or not, whether it is ultimately real or relative only, the point is you are in a state where you have to carry out ethically your dharma. Your swadharma is defined in the context of the mundane reality. That is where you have to do it. That is what Sri Krishna teaches. You can't escape for, from lo some lofty argument. You are here to carry out your dharma and fight the adharma. This is all carried out in the mundane world. Knowing the ultimate reality is beyond all this. You have to carry this out. So the balance and interrelatedness of Paramarthika and Vivarika is very profound, very deep in all our teachings. And therefore, the attempts to bifurcate and then dismiss the Paramarthika part is a very dangerous thing for us, and we should resist it. And this is one of the biggest arguments I'm giving in this book against the Western Indologists who are secularists, some of them outright communists. Uh, so you, they're not, it's not Christian missionaries I'm criticizing in this book. I've done that in other books. It is extreme left wing takeover of Sanskrit studies. Now, it's interesting that they praise Sanskrit and praise the text as secular, and many of our people fall for it. Imagine if uh, there's a murti and there's an archaeologist who's secular. Who's, who doesn't believe in anything divine, any shakti, any presence of divinity. He says, I'll praise it as beautiful painting. It's a beautiful painting. Look at the colors, look at the features, look at the fineness. Or it's a beautiful sculpture. So the praise is there. But the praise as a piece of stone or a piece of painting with nothing sacred in it. A person of our background would not like that. He would say, that's not good enough. I am not interested in this appreciation as this kind of a dead uh, piece. It's living, it has divinity. We've done pran pratishta here. So the same way to praise poetry of Sanskrit as secular vyavarika, lokika, political poetry, to say this is, Ramayana is political poetry, is not something that Ramayana Bhakti will accept. You can say I'm praising you but you're praising in the wrong way. It's very important. And not very many of our people are able to nuance and differentiate that. That's what I wrote in this book, in, in clear terms. How much time do we have, Mohanji? It's 5.50, 5.25? Another? Okay, excellent. Then I have very good time. So, my uh, project here, is to uh, bring to your attention that Vedas are being dismissed for their shruti and looked upon as a source book to understand who was abusing whom. The revival of Sanskrit studies is being promoted as a way to figure out 
how to identify the toxicity as they call it, the poisons as they call it in our texts so that these can be removed. So we shouldn't be very proud that they are helping us. We should be concerned because our traditional people are losing ground when this kind of interpretation becomes fashionable. Now, no serious Christian would take it as a compliment if somebody said, Bible is beautiful poetry and beautiful a military story of uh, heroes and villains and who killed whom and how the emperor conquered. Of course, it has nothing to do with God. I mean, that's just made up. So, on the one hand, claiming to praise the Bible, but removing it of its holiness, removing the holy part of the Holy Bible, would not be acceptable by Christians. Similarly, the Quran, if somebody said there's no truth to the transcendent claims, it is just a story of warfare and some what happened and all that. Myth. You see, the Abrahamic religions do not like to be called myth. They do not... I, this is very interesting. I have a friend who is teaching in one college in the US and, I, and he's been influenced a lot by my thinking on these matters. And he wrote to me one day and said, he's in some uh, technical department, he says they offered a course on world mythologies and he says, because of what you've said, I took that course just to understand. And they're teaching mythologies of non-Abrahamic religions. So he wrote to the guy and said, why not Jesus mythology and, you know, Muhammad mythology and Moses mythology. And he got a very angry reply. He's a faculty member. He got a very angry reply saying that we can't teach like that because nobody will accept it. It will be very, students and their parents will mind it. So he wrote to me. I said, you know, you should tell him that teaching Ramayana as myth is the same problem. I mean, why don't you put in the same stature? If you want scientific proof of Ram, then you should also ask scientific proof of all these other things. Yeah. If you accept it as the faith of a people, then you should accept our faith as a people. So you put it on equal terms and use the same criteria, the same measurement, the same lens, the same yardstick. And he still, he kept fighting. He could never get them to include the Abrahamic religions as part of the mythology course. So to, in the end, they dropped that course completely, but they did not allow him to tamper with the Abrahamic religions. See, we have to fight. We have to have people who are so informed and so educated about our point of view that they are able to assert. If they are scared because they're ignorant, they try one or two times to, uh, you know, assert themselves, and then they, they make a fool of themselves because they don't have the arguments. Then they run away and we lose. So we need informed people who really done the tapasya. This is very hard intellectual tapasya to do this for many, many decades to be that good. We need to train such people. Now, one of the things that uh, came out of this Western Indology is that Sanskrit and Sanskriti spread across South Asia and Southeast Asia as a political device to assert power. In other words, wherever the king could popularize Ramayana, the king would become powerful because he's like Ram. Ram is divine. You can't challenge him, question him. He's a dictator, autocrat, absolute authority. He can oppress, he can ill-treat women, do whatever he wants. And it is allowed because he's the divine king. So the regular king would present himself in that way popularized Ramayana, so it became a tool for political domination. This is a theory. And this is how a huge Sanskrit cosmopolis, as they call it, was created. A whole cosmopolis of Sanskrit was created. No military was required. It was a sophisticated intellectual job. No need for military like in the Roman Empire or any other empire to create a large you know, territory under one under one uh, cultural civilizational system. Here, the kings and the Brahmins had a conspiracy. The Brahmin would do a yagna in public that would make the king look like now with this yagna, he's become divine. He has this authority. The Brahmin, the, the king in turn would sponsor the Brahmin, keep him well fed, give him good funding. And the Brahmin would use this to uh, write prashastis for the king, praise for the king. So they're going back and forth, uh, reinforcing each other. And the result would be, of this collaboration would be, 
that they would produce some nice kavya, political kavya like Ramayan kind of things and other things like it. And this would be a way to showcase, showcase the glory, glamour, might of the king and make the people have awe and therefore the king could, could get away with whatever and nobody would question him. So this theory says that the tradition has to be looked at through kavya. If you want to understand the history of Indian civilization, you have to look at it through kavya. And the kavya has to be not sacred but political kavya. And the political kavya has to be seen as a tool of oppression. So this is a, it's a, it, it shows Sanskrit as a technology for franchising political domination and oppression. That's really what it amounts to. And the strange thing is that until I did this work and uncovered these things and started talking to them, none of our people had bothered to study. We're giving awards. We're giving awards to these people, funding them. And so when I had a few meetings with the leader of this Western Indology group called Sheldon Pollock, who's a very intelligent man, a very hardworking man, a good scholar like the Charvaks, at Columbia University, occupant of a prominent chair, one Padam Shiri, getting a lot of grants. When I, when I had meetings with him, I asked, how come I'm the first person who's taken a very comprehensive view of your life work and written a critique from the insider point of view? People who've written about your point of view are your own students and followers and, you know, they're may, may more or less all the time praising you. But nobody from an opposing camp has written such a comprehensive view. Why? He was very honest. He said, nobody, nobody done it. I didn't stop them. I didn't stop them. It's not my fault. I said, you know, a doctrine, a point of view becomes more interesting when there's a balancing opposing side. And then we have debate. Then we, it's more interesting. Your work is very important. It should make Hindus introspect. Introspect because you are the Puru Pakshin. Somebody should uh, do this introspect, uh, introspect based on your thinking. You are a mirror that can help us learn better. He was absolutely right in saying, I never stopped anybody. They never did it. It's their problem. You, it seems that you should go and talk to them and find out why they haven't done it. They are, the, they are, they are your opponent in the sense that you, you want to take them to task. He's absolutely right. I do not blame the Western Indologists at all. I do not think that we ought to stop them. They are projecting the civilization they come from. And this left-wing atheist Western view is being popularized in Indian academics, like spreading like wildfire, fashionable among the Indian liberal thinking elite. Their idea of liberal is not moksha. It's not moksha. I don't know how you call it liberal. It is some kind of material liberal at a material level. It is important to liberate from poverty and have economic stuff. But so it's a certain imported idea, a certain set of imported doctrines that comprise this corpus, this library of uh, intellectual ideas that are being promoted. A very troubling aspect of the Western Indology on Sanskrit and Sanskriti is something, a doctrine known as deep orientalism. Deep orientalism. Now, orientalism is a term given to uh, the Europeans who were studying Sanskrit. They were called orientalists, starting with uh, Sir William Jones in the 1790s. The picture on the cover shows Sir William Jones and the Pandits. Pandits are sitting on the floor, taking dictation, Sir William Jones telling them. And the story, this is from, this is in huge carving on a wall inside a chapel in Oxford. Take a lot of permission, many long time to, for me to get in a professional camera, go inside and take a picture, put it on the cover. It's my picture, it took a lot of effort. Now Sir William Jones and the Pandits, big carving, is about Sir William Jones calling himself the law giver of, of the Hindus. He made, he gave the Hindus their laws as if we didn't have any. And what he had done is he got a lot of pandits to compile different things from Manu Smriti and here and there. And he did some Sanskrit studies. In two years, he claimed to have become an expert on Sanskrit studies. So he mastered all the texts according to himself. Actually, he was hiring pandits to do the work and 
copy paste here and there and it's not necessarily that he certainly didn't do the tapasya he certainly didn't do the the whole system uh, you know of learning that we we go through but he was the the justice the judge of the supreme court in calcutta that the british east india company set up imagine they set up a court called the supreme court of india but run by the british east india company and he was the judge so he as the first prominent sanskrit scholar from europe said he has discovered sanskrit he became the person often considered to be the one who discovered sanskrit as if we never discovered it before you see so his so he started what became known as orientalism in in and they did a lot of good work also there is no doubt they did a lot of good work also they revived our interest but they took all the important manuscripts to europe they have never been returned by one estimate there are 5 lakh sanskrit manuscripts in foreign archives libraries museums the government of india should ask them back but nobody has bothered so these are some of the oldest manuscripts of our of various texts some of the oldest manuscripts available are not in india but somewhere else so they did this to study they got uh, many ideas out of it they got uh, some scientific ideas linguistic ideas a lot of philosophical ideas which they repackaged as western thought a lot of western enlightenment western thought is actually inspired by other cultures which they plundered which from which they took ideas and as a part of this came the aryan invasion theory it's a by product of uh, in uh, of orientalism max miller produced that less than 200 years ago and then uh, this uh, robert caldwell there's a statue of him in chennai somewhere he founded this davidian theory and we worship these guys as great thinkers they started these theories which in india did not exist i mean the tamil literature is so rich if there was this history of we the tamil people and we are we have been opposed by those the aryan people if that this was true then how come for thousands of years so many thousands of pages of tamil text never mentioned this kind of theory there is no aryan dravidian divide no sense of we are the dravidian people that does not exist in the tamil texts it suddenly pops up when bishop caldwell thinks it's a good idea and we accepted it so either we have to think that we are dumb our ancestors were dumb and all this talk about great literary heritage is devoid of enough self reflection and we never discovered that we are dumb idiots we never really discovered that either we have to accept that or we have to say that this whole theory is wrong so it's become political it's become politically incorrect to talk about all this to raise issues but once upon a time when caldwell and uh, these this uh, max miller created these different theories you know the point is that within europe these were discussed but in india nobody nobody argued no no response was given the aryan theory was accepted very useful to the europeans because the germans could feel they have a heritage the old great heritage of aryans british could feel that their their rule in india is justified because if they are the aryans then they should uh, civilize the natives aryans being superior so this this is an example of how indology indology without response from our side becomes toxic becomes a poison becomes a dangerous thing and today's entire this dalit movement started as a caste system movement and caste system is a distortion of jati and varna it, we don't have the word caste is not a sanskrit word even so you have to look at the history of lord risley in the late late 1800s to see how he formulated and crystallized this idea of a linear hierarchical caste system when before that it was a very fluid kind of a thing there were jatis some were poor some were rich there were problems but it was not fixed like caste prob, caste uh, kind of a thing so one of the audacious theories being promulgated is that orientalism it all its bad things that they did helping the colonizers orientalists were like the intellectual army supporting the colonizer working for them funded by them they were doing the r and d for the colonizer 
and so that is being uh, exposed as racist. And uh, now the counter argument that has come up says that these Orientalists did not come up with racism on their own. They discovered this racism by studying Sanskrit. That Sanskrit contained ideas of abusing other people, excluding other people, ethnic superiority, inferiority, this hierarchy, violence over other people was discovered by the colonizers when they studied Sanskrit. They got this idea and they also started adopting it. So their rule in India was not something the British thought of doing this kind of colonial oppression. They just continued the Brahmin and Kshatriya oppression. Oppression was always going on and they just continued, they stepped into the shoes of the Indians, used the Indian Hindu law and continued the oppression. So this is a way to absolve Europeans, let them off the hook uh, of, of the things they've done. And then the theory goes that Nazis, the Nazis in Germany studied Sanskrit and got a lot of these ideas of oppression which led to the Holocaust. So this whole Nazism, alien, uh, hating the others, while having violence against the others, rather than finding this, the origin of this in Germany was Germany's own history, rather than looking for racism in the past of the Europeans, which is full of that, rather than looking at it in the Bible, the hatred for some other people. This tribe has to kill that tribe and this and that. Rather than looking at these things in their own civilizational past, this, field, this group of Indologists like to claim that these ideas originated in Sanskrit. So hence Sanskrit is deep Orientalism and this other Orientalism of Europe is a superficial one. I don't let them off the hook. I tell them that the earlier the Orientalism was European, today's Orientalism is American. This is Orientalism 2.0. It's a more sophisticated Orientalism. And I give a different history of how this Orientalism is based on, you know, genocide of Native Americans, slavery of blacks, all that kind of stuff, to remind them that they can't blame all this on Sanskrit. It is, this is their own problem. This problem is their own problem and they have to deal with it. So, in this manner, I give you uh, each chapter in each chapter a major area where I feel uh, Sanskrit studies has to be revived correctly from the insider point of view with the sacredness preserved, not looking at it primarily as a political social doctrine. Now we have political issues, we have social issues. We must study them, we must find solutions for them. But we don't have to denigrate and throw out all our sacred texts as a result. We, we don't have to do it in a, say, in a leftist, atheistic style. But at the same time, we have to acknowledge we got problems and we have to take ownership and resolve and deal with those problems. We have to do that. Okay. So I'm not uh, absolving us from the responsibility to tackle you know, social political problems which we definitely have. Now, what I uh, want to do as a result of this analysis is I want to create what I call a home team. And to me a home team is a group of people or multiple groups of people based in India committed to taking back the Adhikar, taking back Sanskrit studies, Indology and so on. So we have the world class journals, academic journals here, academic conference once a year, best university type of for Indology and Sanskrit studies right here. And these should be connected with the spiritual organizations like Ramakrishna Mission, various mathas, and also fluent in English, fluent in studying and doing Purpaksha and others. So I am looking for alliances with traditional groups of scholars to create this sort of a network of uh, home team. A home team of scholars, Swadeshi Indology, you might call it. So I, uh, uh, I want to conclude by just telling you that this book was always kind of in the pipeline, but I became more enthusiastic and interested because 
about 18 months ago, I was told that uh, Shingeri Peetham was going to give to an Ivy League university and under the control of one of these Charvak people, the authority to represent Adi Shankara's legacy, Adi Shankara's philosophy, officially in the name of Shingeri Peetham. So it's like outsourcing your heritage. It's an amazing thing. I mean, this is so amazing that they were about to do that. So I intervened. I didn't say stop and all. I just said, let me do a Purva Paksh and present it to you. Then you can decide. They had not done a Purva Paksh. You are about to spend $4 million budget to set this up. Why can't you spend a tiny fraction to get a report from some neutral people on who are these guys, who are these Charavaks, is it fair or unfair? What do they think of Adi Shankara? You know, all that has to be figured out. And I ran into a lot of anger rather than thanking me for helping them, rather than they kind of thought I'm spoiling, I'm kind of interfering. I don't have any intention to interfere. I just want to do my job as a scholar and bring this to the knowledge of the public and let people decide for themselves what they, uh, they want to do. So if Ramakrishna Mission were deciding that they'll create a Swami Vivekanand chair in some Ivy League, I would suggest it is very important before you do that, let's do a Purva Paksh on those scholars. What have that university produced? Who are these scholars? What is their ideology? What wavelength are they on? And even if they are fine, I would put in the contract some requirements that they must subscribe to certain things, certain lifestyle. They, and, and I would also make sure that people ordained as monks in the Ramakrishna mission are the ones who are sent because they should be the ones representing. And it should not be that we give the money, put some name and let others do it. I will tell you that Judaism studies is mostly done by rabbis, mostly. Many imams are involved in Islam studies. Many ordained Buddhists by Dalai Lama are teaching Buddhism. So it is not like ordained monks are not allowed to teach in the academy. They are, they should be, if they get proper degrees and credentials. So I would rather spread the ideas globally using our own resources as opposed to handing somebody else millions of dollars and hoping that they'll treat us well because that's not a smart idea. So adding further pain, a few in the last, last few days I heard that the new government is thinking of $50 million to be given to Western Indology. So I'll have more fights. And that's because now the Western Indologists are trying to infiltrate the government, infiltrate the government by getting Hindus who are close to the government organizations to represent their case. And some of these Hindus are well established with the Hindu political organizations, well established, but compromised in the sense that they think the other side is good, they're not bad, they, sh they, they want to, you know, want to get Indians to fund Westerners to do Indology. Very strange, very strange. So uh, with that, I will close. Thank you very much and I would love to take your questions. Sir, uh, I'm Sham and I have one question. When we talk about the home team and when we talk about how we have to, you know, take hold of the Indic narrative and handle it, one thing that I notice is you need a scholarship or an intellectual backing to be recognized in journals and other places. And for that to happen, those centers are controlled primarily outside of India. So how do people who are interested in the Indic narrative and creating it from the traditional point of view get the academic credentials or the adhikaritwa to actually contribute to work? Excellent point. It's a chicken and egg. It's a chicken and egg. Uh, it's like you, there is, in the TV industry, there is content and then there's the channel of distribution. So if people control the channel of distribution, they will not allow our content. And what do we do if we want new content? It won't be allowed. So in, in the argument you've given, the new intellectual content is not being allowed in the old journals and conferences unless it conforms. And you will not be able to write a PhD in a university of that kind unless you are on their wavelength to some extent. Maybe you can say certain things but not beyond a certain point. So 
if I have innovative content and the channels don't accept it, I have to create my own channel. We have to create media channels, we have to create academic journal channels, academic conferences, and that is what the government should be doing. They should be creating, uh, rather than funding foreign Indology, and rather than funding foreign guys and enhancing their power even more, what they ought to be doing is creating an annual India, Indian Indology conference in India, creating a huge journal of Indology in India with eminent Indian, Indian devotees of various traditions, people involved in the practice of those traditions, they should be given the funds to have world-class journals, not the people in Western Indology. And we should create a university like Nalanda. They revived Nalanda, gave it to uh, Amartya Sen, and he was basically reviving a very, he was creating a very secular, atheist, left-wing uh, social sciences to bash our tradition in the name of uh, Nalanda. That's as ridiculous as giving the Adi Shankara legacy to some, uh, you know, Charvaks. It's completely ridiculous, yet it was done. So we need to bring our dharmic ideas of higher learning back in India under the control and we need to have a organization where Ramakrishna Mission has a member, some Pithams have a member, various other sampradayas and lineages have an appointment. So this kind of a council, this kind of a, a, a committee or trust, uh, you know, with this kind of a governing body where our internal mechanism, uh, the adhikaris are represented and then we are doing Indology in that way. That is how I would go about it. It needs big money and the government ought to be doing this. Just one follow-up question, sir. As a common person who cannot exactly do all of this now and as a person who's interested in, you know, defending Indic scholarship, where do I get started? Well, it depends on if you're a common person with money to give, you can write us a check. Uh, we're always happy to do that too. We're, we're going to organize India, uh, traditional scholars, organization in between Karnataka and Ch Tamil Nadu and they'll need funding, they'll need conferences, they'll, we, we want every three, four months an event, a meeting. So we need some resources for that. If you are uh, not in, in that mode, uh, if you are somebody who's able to take the knowledge we are producing like I'm producing and turn it into blogs, turn it into videos, turn it into documentaries, turn it into user-friendly material, then that's something you could do. So I did a workshop in Bangalore, we had 83 people, how to be an intellectual Kshatriya, that was the purpose. And I gave them projects from my book, saying, okay, I have all these things identified, each of you, you make groups. So six groups were made voluntarily, I left the room and they made their own groups, and each group came up with a work plan of what they will do based on this book. So if, uh, if you find enough people interested in Chennai, you call me back, I'll do a workshop on how to be an intellectual Kshatriya. And we could start one group here. We have come to the end of this talk. On behalf of the revered Swamiji's, the Brahmacharis and the devotees, Rajiji, we extend a heartfelt thanks to you for having accepted and delivered this talk here. And as a devotee of the Ramakrishna Matan Mission, I'd like to thank our revered Swamiji who have sat through this uh, talk, heard him, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of discussions based on whatever he has said. To you all, Swamiji's and the Brahmacharis, I extend my heartfelt thanks. Priyatam Pundari Kaksha Sarva Yagneshwaro Harihi Tasman Tushte Jagat Tushtam Prenite Prenitam Jagat Harihi Om Tatsat Sri Ramakrishna Arpanamastu. Thank you.